Okay, it's uh, three after, we'll get started. It's a little uh, funny, haha -ha kind of uh, title of this, but really what I'm talking about is how things have been changing. And a lot of that's been happening in our personal lives as well as in the cyber world, where changes are happening. And we're semi-aware of them, but really sometimes we get caught off guard. Um, so I uh, work for PowerMation, business development manager. I get kind of a lot of things under my hat. IAOT, uh, remote access, Ethernet products, um, cybersecurity. I also uh, manage the software solutions within PowerMation, as well as networking and control. So I, I cover sort of a large basket of things. It's easier to say what I don't cover. Um, <clears throat> I don't usually do like robotics or anything like that unless it's network connection related. Um, we got Daryl and JD for that, so they're they're top notch. And then Festo is with Lance, so. Um, so I cover mainly two-thirds of our product line to a certain degree. So this is just the paragraph that we had explaining what's going on, but really what we're working against is cybersecurity and we're working against the bad guys. And the bad guys are finding ways to disrupt your lives, either in your personal life, like I said, or in the cyber world. And Google and Microsoft and Apple, they're big targets, and so they're trying to make changes to the system so that they can mitigate that, they can prevent bad actors from doing things, and then you become the casualty of that because they're making extra, extra work for you. And it's what I call the bad actor dance, and so really you've got a lot of uh, bad people doing things, you make a mitigation to try to prevent the bad actor, and then it comes back and hurts you again. And so when you think about that, in the, in whether again, whether it be the physical world or in the cyber world, You've got um, exploits and vulnerabilities that are happened, they're discovered, and you've probably heard of these things, you know, people getting hacked, the ransomware of your software and stuff. And then you figure, hey, I've, you know, I've figured out what happened, you know, I figured out why I don't have access, so now I've mitigated that, and then I feel like a happy person again, but guess what? Now you've got a bad actor doing something else. So in the physical world, and this is where it kind of resonates with people like the TSA, Anybody remember back in the good old days where you could just hop on an airplane? Maybe your family could say goodbye to you as you're standing in the window and the airplane's taken off. And then all of a sudden, okay, well, you can't let everybody in the airport because then bad people are going to come in, so we need to go through security checkpoints. And then people with knives and guns go through, and then somebody tries to put a bomb in their shoe and all this other stuff. And so the bad actor tries to find a way. And it's really hard to stop that. I mean, it's kind of like mouse, right? You get a, one mouse in your house, guess what? You've got more than one mouse in your house. You've got 100 mice in there. They're just all behind the walls. Same with cockroaches and other things. Counterfeit money is another good example. You know, they said, hey, this is great. We're just going to use very inexpensive tender, you know, the, the dollar bill printed on paper. And now they've got strings and everything else in there trying to thwart the counterfeiters. Drug runners, hackers, and all that stuff. And then there's unintended consequences, right? So all of a sudden they say, hey, you know, you freak out on an airplane. You should be able to put your dog in there, emotional support animal. And then everybody, now all of a sudden you got ostriches and, and rabbits on airplanes as emotional support animals. And then they say, you know what, change the rules. Nobody can bring anything anymore. So, you know, always, somebody's always wrecking it. And I'm, and I'm not saying that those people are necessarily a devil emoji that puts a, a, a rabbit on an airplane because maybe they got legitimate issues. <laughs> Um, first of all, if, if you're rabbits, you're some emotional support animal, you've got legitimate issues, but um, I'm not judging, so if anybody is a rabbit lover. Um, but there's also like vehicle safety. There's an argument that putting seat belts in made people drive a little loosey-goosey. Putting airbags in, now I can go a little faster. You know, those types of things, people think they're covered in a safety net so they can do things a little bit more, um, a little bit more sort of careless, if you will. Another one that I thought was fascinating that I've heard a lot of news reports is GPS traffic monitoring. So as you're driving, and, and if you live in one of those, you know, Chicago, maybe not so much here, but um, sometimes even in the uh, Minneapolis-St. Paul area, you get a traffic and it routes you through residential streets. And I'm like, I wonder if those homeowners really like the fact that the interstate highway system is now driving through their front yard. And that's actually happened a few times. So now... The solution to that is, is you can go in as a community and say you don't want GPS to be routed through your community when, there, when there's a problem with a freeway. Um, and so there's all these kind of things that you have to work through because of the ebbs and flows and, and the changes that have been happening in our world. So specifically to cybersecurity, we have cyber threats and it's a constant state of flux. Um, 
Any of you haven't done this yet, um, it might be a fun little exercise. There's a website called Shodan.io, and what I like to do is I like to pick on Rockwell because they're not here today. Unless you work for Rockwell, then you can pretend like I didn't say anything. But if you enter in Rockwell on the Shodan.io website, that's a Google search engine for devices. And this is just a print screen of it, but there's 5,629 Allen Bradley PLCs right now on the public internet. It's a federal crime for you to attempt to attach to them, by the way, so don't do that. Uh, but it isn't a federal crime to know that they're out there. So if you think your Allen Bradley is using an IP address that nobody would ever guess, because what, there's 4.3 billion IP addresses out on the internet, nobody would guess mine, the Shodan just figured it out for you. Um, same with Google allows you to search for, you know, I want to buy a truck or I'm looking for a, you know, some fancy backyard piece of furniture. You can just go out there and Google it and it Google engine scrub, you know, go out and search everything. What they do is they send out a request to a website and they look for open ports and they look for signatures as feedback. And so what you see on the right, it says the signature feedback is that it's a Rockwell automation product. Now, Many of you might be Horner Electric users. Uh, type in Horner Electric, you'll get nothing. Type in APG, you'll get nothing. Now, that doesn't mean that they're not out there, but it means that it's uh, potentially not signature driven so that there isn't, just throwing a shout out to a Horner team in the back of the room there. Um, but that doesn't mean that they're not out there and available for you to try to attach to. It's just that Shodan doesn't recognize that device and it's not something that they even know what it is. So the way that you can also use this tool is to find what port is open. So you could say, well, I know a Horner controller programs over this particular port. You can enter in that port, and it'll tell you all of the websites that are out there with that port open. So it's not just vendor-based, as well as webcams and stuff like that that are out there. Just a little FYI. So what we've been doing in the industry is we're moving more towards secure communications. Most of you have probably heard show of... Um, Snowden, he was just actually on the news this morning. He was the, the guy that released a whole bunch of documents from the NSA and all that snooping stuff that they're doing. And it, they're really doing some bad things by collecting all your information and storing it in a warehouse, and electronic warehouse in, in Utah. But he released all this stuff, and then all of a sudden he's a bad guy because he's basically transparency from a cybersecurity perspective in the U.S. government. That's up for debate. Some people think he's a bad guy. Some people think he's a hero but he's now in Russia. But he decided to release all that stuff. Well, when that happened, they said, okay, well, all of this information is being uh, recorded, all the traffic, all the web traffic is going on. And most of it was over HTTP, so it's free and open. So, um, which was kind of uh, funny, there was a, a funny ha-ha, or funny weird, open Wi-Fi hotspot. So there's an open Wi-Fi hotspot here, my laptop's on it. And you go to a coffee shop, there's open Wi-Fi hotspot. Well, you can use um, Wireshark, and you will see all of the traffic. Because if it's an open Wi-Fi hotspot, in other words, you don't have to put in a password, everything is in the clear. Almost like you're using a switch, and you're recording everything. So if I turned on Wireshark right now, I would probably see reams and reams of traffic be putting into my laptop. And I can record it and put it to a file, and then go back and dissect it later. Anything over HTTP is in the open, including all the passwords that you're entering on your websites and everything. So there was a tool that somebody made from Mozilla, you know, Firefox, that allowed you to capture somebody's Facebook credentials because there's a session cookie that says you are talking to Facebook over the session cookie, and they grab that session cookie, and now they're you. And so you'd go to a coffee shop, and it would bring up all the, all the people, all their profiles in Facebook, and the little column on the left, and you could go in there and say, well, I want to be Fran, uh, Francis, or I want to be Bob, or I want to be Joe, or whatever. And you would just impersonate that person and take over their Facebook account. So those are the kind of things that are out there and make you very vulnerable. That's why we've been moving towards HTTPS. Then we say, okay, everything's great. We got HTTPS. It's all secure communications. I can trust HTTPS because, you know, only good people have certificates, right? There's the need for the certificate stuff became more and more prevalent because they wanted to do all the secure communications, so they decided to create this thing called um, Let's Encrypt, which gives you free certificates. So anybody can get a free cert on Let's Encrypt, including the bad guys. So everybody sees that URL up there, right? www.paypal.com. That's not actually PayPal. 
I used a uppercase I instead of a lowercase L. So if you were to click on that, it would, it would bring you out to paypai.com. And right now, there's a, uh, you can buy a subscription to the service that allows you to take a URL and modify it. And you can even modify it with other ASCII characters so it looks very similar. You send that link to somebody saying, hey, uh, there's some problem with your PayPal account. Please log in. They click on it, it brings them out because of Let's Encrypt out to a website that looks like PayPal because they use the same pictures and all that. You enter in your username and password, submit, you just submitted it to the bad guys. And you're done. And that's going on right now. And so there's a lot of people getting hijacked. So if your Facebook account's been hijacked or your login credentials are being hijacked for your email, that's probably how they're doing it. And unbeknownst to you, but you're using an open Wi-Fi hotspot. So what are some of the mitigations for that? Um, well, first of all, never use open Wi-Fi hotspots, and I'm guilty of it right now, but I'm, I know that I'm doing secure communications via email and HTTPS communications and everything else I'm, I'm not doing on the laptop. Um, or use a VPN provider. There's a lot of them out there. And make sure you always use HTTPS communications. And even that's not going to prevent you from getting hijacked in that particular case. So then you might come back and say, well, what about um, changing or about two-factor authentication. So two factors of authentication, one is something you know, your username and password is something you have, like your phone. And everybody's like, oh, sounds great, right? So I, I log in, and then all of a sudden I get a, an email or a text message on my phone to enter in the, the, the password thing on there. But what if they compromised your, your email account? Now they've got that one-time use code. Or what if they've uh, sim-jacked your phone? So they call your phone provider and say, yeah, this is Terry, and you know what? My phone just fell in the river. I need another SIM card. Can you please send one out? They send one out, you plug it in, and now you've just taken over their, their phone account, and that happens a lot, SIM jacking. That's usually somebody that's a high target, though. It's not somebody that would be in this room. It would be like state you know, government people and stuff that you'd want to actually go after. So smartphones are typically used as that second factor, but there, are they secure? And then email is also your second factor. Is that secure? Um, but you're, it's a good idea to lock your phone because nowadays every second factor is your phone and if, you, if you're at a bar or something like that and you leave it on the counter or you know your kids or something want to buy something on Amazon and they, and they submit it and then you get a thing and then the kid grabs your phone and says, yeah, I want to buy 3,000 cases of bubble gum or something like that. Now you are just a 3,000 case bubble gum owner right there. So you have to be mindful of that. Your phone is now that lock and key for your identity. And then... Uh, I thought it was always super stupid to change your passwords all the time because what does it mean when you're going to change your passwords once every week? You're going to come up with a really dumb password like password or one, two, three, four, five, six or monkey or something like that. What you want is a really long, complicated password like a jingle to a song and it's the first and third letter or something like that or it's all, you know, don't make it your pet because that's how, you know, the Paris Hiltons get hacked because they password's the name of their dog and stupid things like that. But make it a really, really long 14 character thing and make it gibberish and that becomes very secure because nobody can figure out what that gibberish is. Um, and then that's what you use all the time. But changing passwords a lot is now you gotta write it down, you gotta figure it out. The other thing is password managers are, um, if anybody's used like LastPass, there's several of them out there like that. And they give you the ability to log into websites through like a plugin in your Chrome browser. And what they do is they actually look at the URL, like that PayPal one. It wouldn't allow you to stuff your credentials into the login box because that is not a recognized URL that you have passwords for in your browser. So then you would be able to say, okay, there's something going on here because I went to PayPal and it didn't actually bring up the LastPass or the Bitwarden, I think is the other one. There's KeyPass and a few others that work that way to be able to put your credentials in there. So that also gives you a little bit of mitigation. IoT, how many of you got a camera or some other thing in your home like a lock, uh, light bulbs? Most of that stuff goes to China because that's who makes all those IoT, very inexpensive $10 light bulbs. Um, very few of them actually are housed in the US and a lot of it goes up to Amazon. And who's in charge of that server that the light bulb is connecting to and is the firmware in that light bulb malicious or not because once it's inside your network it can you know spider web out and there's been a lot of vulnerabilities in those IOT devices so to protect an IOT situation you always want to connect them to a guest network bare minimum 
So if, you, if it's a Wi-Fi version, you enable guest network and you make sure that anybody that's on the guest network doesn't have access to the rest of your devices. There's a checkbox for that in most routers to say, do not allow guests to get to my LAN. Or you create VLANs in your system, so that's one network. But the easier way to do it is everybody's got multiple routers. You know, I bought one and it got old, it's got slow or whatever, and I bought another one. Just take the, a router that you would have all your computers connecting to, another router that your Wi-Fi devices are connecting to, or your uh, IoT devices, and then that goes to your router for your internet service provider. Now there's no way for the devices on this router to go up and back down to that router. So now you've isolated your network. Yeah, your locks in your house or your light bulbs might be hacked by the Chinese, but at least it's not getting to your computers and your printers. <coughs> so in the industrial space, you know, raise your hand if you're around in the 90s and the 80s. Not <laughs> yeah, there was one. Yeah, Phil was, Jeff was. Um, but we had all these devices connecting up computers, and our IT departments are really happy. Things are going great. They're connecting all these computers. And then all those control guys started saying, hey, you know what? Ethernet's inexpensive. We can put it in our PLCs and our HMIs. Let's connect all those things together. And then all of a sudden they thought, you know what? We've got a lot of computers and a lot of devices. Let's connect everything together so it's one big happy family. So you've got tens of thousands of devices, and you've got a bad actor that goes and just basically runs havoc. So, you, you know, some people say, well, we air gap, you know, we never connect our PLCs. We'll never say never. You know, the only way to really stop, everybody knows the way to stop somebody from connecting to your Ethernet PLC, right? It's a squirt of epoxy right in that Ethernet hole so that nobody could ever stick a cable in there ever again. Outside of that, somebody's going to stick a cable into that Ethernet jack. So you have, you have to figure out how you can isolate that. IT departments love virtual networks. They like to compartmentalize things. So I've got this big 48-port switch sitting right behind me, you know, all the little lights blinking and all that, and I've got all kinds of cables. I'm going to take these four making a VLAN, these four making a VLAN, these four making a VLAN. Now let's do that in the control space. Let's do that on every machine. So you're going to buy a big 48-port switch, put it inside the back of a control panel, and try to VLAN that out to your network. That's not realistic, but it does stop your bad actor because you're compartmentalizing that bad actor. So VLANs are really not something that you're going to use in that OT space because it's not convenient at all to do that, especially running those cables around. Because what we like to do is we found an Ethernet hole. Guess what? Ooh, I can plug into that and I can get access to everything. So now you want to VLAN that and say, okay, every PLC and every HMI, there's an independent cable that goes up to that 48-port switch. Now you're spending tens of thousands of dollars on Ethernet cables. Now, the Ethernet cable guy that sells you the Ethernet cables would love that. But So what we've kind of moved into, and this is something that was architected, designed. You can get it out on Wiki. It's the, what they call the Purdue model. Um, I don't know what that Purdue is, a P Purdue University or something like that, and I hope I spelled it correctly. But we're talking about defense in depth, and where we take your valuable assets and you put it underneath a, a router appliance, and then that's underneath another one and underneath another one. So we have what we call zones. And so at the very top, you've got the Internet. It goes down into that light blue zone. That's your enterprise zone. That's where your office computers are and stuff. And sometimes companies will break off and do something called a demilitarized zone. Their websites um, sort of outside e-commerce that people would log into to do web, you know, web things. That's in that upper right um, yellow area. And then below that, we'll call that the control zone or the, the, uh, the blue or the purplish area is the manufacturing zone. Some companies that take it to the 10th degree or the nth degree or whatever, they'll have what they call a demilitarized zone between the enterprise and the control network. Nothing can go through. You can only go in and out. So how would you do that, right? How would you get access to something down here They'll put a whole bunch of virtual machines in that control DMZ area. And then if you're a controls engineer and you're sitting at your desk and you want to program a PLC down here, you actually have to log into a remote desktop session inside of a virtual machine and launch your PLC programming software to do all your changes. You're not allowed to go through the demilitarized zone, only allowed to go in, attached to a computer that can then go down. That way they can do audit trail logs and everything else for that particular uh, platform or that particular location. We go below that and now we get into um, the cell zone down here which would be your control panel. So you create those zones and then you use routers and firewalls between the zones. So you, the easiest way to block traffic, right? Everybody's got a router in their home and everybody feels pretty comfortable 
that the bad guys can't get onto your local area network from the internet, that that router is protecting you. Well, it doesn't always protect you, and there's very um, specific attacks that people can do on your router, but for all practical purposes, that router is supposed to be your security appliance. So routers allow traffic to easily go up, but it's very hard to go down. So what do we try to do? We try to break that or we try to mitigate that, right? Because um, I want to be able to get access to those things deep down inside my, my network. So the, the NAT router, the pro, is it's easy for communications to go up. It's hard to go down without creating network address translation rules. So what does that mean? I've got an HMI. I've got a Horner HMI. Props to Horner in the back of the room there. And it's a 10005 IP address, and I've got a web HMI screen on that thing, and I want to be able to see it from my house. And this is in a manufacturing company. So how would you solve that problem? Well, first thing you would do is you'd go up to that border router, the one way up on the top, and you would find whatever IP address that it's using, like 3.8. And I just made that up. And then on the inside of that, which would be in the enterprise zone, I've got a 172.16.0.15 IP address, another one that I just made up. And I make a hole. I either port forward or I, I do a NAT. Now I get down there. That's great. Now I'm inside that office. So what do I do next? I go to the next layer and I create another NAT rule that goes, jumps down from that 172 to that 192. And then I create another NAT rule that jumps down there. And now I have access to my Horner Web on my screens. Well, how many IP, IT departments would allow you to do that? First of all, if they did, they'd probably be fired because that's a really bad idea. You know why that's a bad idea? Because the bad guys can see all the way down and be able to you know, break in and do all kinds of bad actor things. So that's why you don't ever do that. But how many people do that in their homes? How many people have taken your public IP address that's on your network at home, routed it to the web camera in the backyard so you can look at the kittens or the puppy dogs? That happens a lot. And also, anybody knows something called universal plug and play does the same thing on your router. So if you launch something that, uh, that makes your router universal plug and play, it actually opens up a hole in your router so you can reverse drill into it. So if you do have universal plug and play turned on in your home router, you should turn it off because a bad actor on your LAN, like a bad piece of software, can turn an open port, um, give you access to the Internet. So then the solution to that is you just create firewall rules, right? Everybody loves to create firewall rules. I mean, I'm sure everybody this morning before they left to leave to come here went into your router and added some more firewall rules, right? No, not so much. What's the best way to stop, um, you know, the bad actors, right? How many people in here stop bad people from coming into your home, right? Just about everybody. How do you do it? You use a key. Only the good guys have the key or the passcode to get in, right? So how does the TSA stop the bad guys from getting in the airport, right? They gave all the good guys a key? No, it's an elaborate game of whack-a-mole trying to find that bad guy in a crowd. So the TSA solution in your home is silly because you don't want to vet everybody that comes in the door to see if they're a bad guy. You know, do their eyes shift back and forth? You know, are they wearing a hoodie? Do they have black glasses on top of their, or shades on top of their head? They might slide them down, and if anybody's wearing shades, they're always bad actors. So. What we like to do in the OT, which is down here in the control panel, is you can whitelist things. You can say everything is blocked, but allow this HMI to talk to that PLC. You can do that, but you can't do that up in the enterprise zone. It would be way too complicated. So in the enterprise, we usually do what we call the blacklisting. We block all the bad guys, but down here, we don't do that. We generally block everything, and we allow the good guys to come in. So remote access, we've probably heard that term, and really what are we talking about with remote access? Well, peer-to-peer -peer communications, by definition, means everybody can talk to each other, but very much like this room or like in the room out there. It's all peer-to-peer. -peer. So if we are a LAN. Well, not really, because I'm talking and you're listening, so this isn't considered a LAN. Uh, but out there, when everybody's talking amongst each other, it's a, it's a one big LAN. So now we've got these NAT routers that only allow traffic to go up. So how do we get things to talk to each other, right? So what we do is we say, well, I want, um, well, first of all, what a, what a router does is it acts like a telephone. So what it's going to do, it's going to say, 
traffic can go up, but we don't allow traffic to go inbound. So imagine a Christmas dinner, and you don't want to be interrupted by somebody trying to sell you windows, so you just turn off the phone in your home. You can still dial out, but nobody can dial in and interrupt your dinner, and that's the analogy I use for NAT routers. So what I was going to say is you've got a device A over here that needs to talk to device B. Well, how does device A talk to B, right? We talked about that a second ago. You have to go to that network and drill a whole bunch of holes with NAT rules and port forwarding and everything else, throw in a bunch of firewall rules and all that, and then, then you get the IT department yelling at you because that's a horrible idea. Or just like in MASH, right, Radar O'Reilly calls Sparky, you know, spins up the phone and calls the operator or some of those old television shows where, they, where there's a phone operator. The phone operator then makes a connection. So device number A connects to the cloud server, device number B connects to the cloud server. Now the cloud server has a way to go backwards through the tunnel because of the IP address and all that is being resolved. So even though you're going from that 10.005 into the 192.168 and then into the 172 and all that, as you go backwards, those are routers that are uh, NAT routers which are stateful so they have memory. They remember the track out and so for a short period of time they can remember the track going back and I think it's five or ten minutes or something like, like that. And that remembrance allows you, to, or statefulness, allows you to go backwards through that tunnel which is how the phone operator can connect you down to B. And that's it. That's the essence of remote access. So one of the solutions we have is Sikamia Secure Remote Access. At PowerMation, we have others. We have Secure Cloud from Phoenix Contact. We have Red Lion's got one called RL Connect as well. Um, and all those remote access solutions basically work the same way. We've got devices inside your control panel. You've got some piece of hardware, and it connects up to the server. And then using some software, you connect up. And I sometimes call this technician to machine because you're a technician and you want to connect in and program a, your PLC or machine. Um, and that's, that's what this little box does. Uh, Phoenix Contact has an MGuard which does essentially the same thing as this. It's just a little different technology. And Red Lion has something very similar to this as well. So when you're making those tunnels, you have these um, devices sitting inside the control panel, again, like I said, they can connect up. They connect up to a gate manager or some sort of server, and they're connected down, and you can do data pushing through there oftentimes. That's one of the things that is somewhat unique about Seekamia is they have a data collection module in here, so they can harvest data, and they can push it to Amazon, AWS, Azure. Um, they also have the ability to create virtual tunnels. So you could have a whole bunch of these connected up, and they could all do peer-to-peer -peer communications off one big virtual tunnel and it is a drag and drop configuration, so that is nice. The other thing you can do with the Sikamia solution is we have the ability to do uh, mobile connections. So they have what they call Link Manager Mobile. So you log in with your web, web browser. For example, I've got a little app on my phone here, and I call it Horner Web MI. I did plagiarize that name from our Horner friends in the back. But what this does is it goes out to the cloud, makes a Link Manager Mobile connection, drills down into the Horner that's sitting, it's been running like this for like 10 years sitting at my desk, and it simulates a car, a driving car, you know, it's just your RPM and your speed and all that stuff, just kind of a silly little little demo, a little four-inch Horner sitting there doing that all day long. And I'm using uh, Seekamia to give you that access. So with an app or a web browser on your phone, you can now get access to those screens. So if you're driving down the countryside and you want to know, hey, is my Horner sprinkler running? You know, my irrigation system going? Is my grain dryer drying my grain? Or whatever the case may be, you can log into your your uh, Horner controller from a Sikamia solution to get access to those devices. So when I talked briefly about that, you know, you can grab data and push it up. Um, there's Data gets located in different areas within the manufacturing zone. So these are the different zones we talked about sort of in that Purdue model. The ERP, that's your business operations, you know, maybe your email servers and stuff. And then you have the manufacturing layer. So if I'm running batch number three, part number number four, how many widgets do I run a run? Oftentimes the MES stuff then gets pushed down into the control area where an operator or something is going to take it, enter it into a machine because they're running different batches. Well, all of that stuff and then the supervisory control and data acquisition layer, all these things probably have data in every one of those layers. You know, obviously your business system has data. Manufacturing has data, what batch you're running, that type of thing. 
the SCADA layer might be just data for your running processes, like your overall equipment effectiveness. How many rejects do I have? What's my current cell doing? And then you have data all the way down into the HMI. And now I talk about those different data areas. One thing that's interesting, if you visit the Horner booth, they've got an OEE. So it's collecting overall effectiveness data. Well, is that important to the ERP? Should I push that data up into the office so that they know what's, what's going on up there? Or is it only relevant until I have a problem? I had a customer that said, yeah, we want OEE. And I said, why do you want OEE? And they said, because the end user keeps blaming us for downtime. I'm like, well, do you want OEE in every machine? No, only the ones that are the problem. How do you know it's a problem? Well, because people complain. It's like, well, it's kind of a circular conversation. I said, really, what you want to do is you want to have a digital flight recorder. So if your airplane crashes or the customer calls you up and complains, you can pull a file off and say, eh, based on this, a lot of people were pressing the stop button or your in feed was starving or your down feed was overloaded or something like that. So then you can take and some of the ways to data harvest is you can take the data and write it to a CSV file. Just about every HMI, if they're worth a grain of salt, has got the ability to store files. And then you write some sort of scheme so you hang on to the file for 30 days. But maybe it is something where you need to send that data up to the MES layer. Yes, I've completed this batch of 40 parts with this part number. Now you've got to push it up there. How do you push it up there? Yeah. That's, the, uh, that's the IT guy's problem, right? The files are sitting on my Horner controller. Just grab them off and stop bothering me. So sometimes you need to push the data in different locations. So you've got to figure out how you can push the data. You can't pull it anymore, right? You know why? Because there's all these routers in there. Or you call the IT guy and say, can you punch a hole in that router? Because i got a system that needs to go down and pull that data out. So what we've been working towards in the industry are uh, push methods. And they're in their infancy. They're, they're, they're certainly not full and rich, and they're actually quite a nuisance. <laughs> Anybody who's done, done MQTT, guess how many MQTT variants are out there? We probably can't guess because there's so many of them. They're probably being minted right now. The big ones that we talk about is Microsoft Azure. Their MQTT connection security model is unique to them. As Amazon, it's unique to them. Amazon uses a certificate exchange and Microsoft does not. They use a different kind of a key token kind of thing. Um, there's also generic MQT. Anybody heard of Ignition or Sparkplug? That's a unique generic MQTT. But it's not generic. It's more proprietary to Ignition. You have to buy a license to use it. So. The generic MQTT is also another variant, and that's you can use Mosquito as a broker. So if you happen to be visiting the Horner website, there's a lot of how-tos on getting a Horner to talk MQTT and push it to a broker. So there's a lot of that stuff out there. Um, once you get it into MQTT, you need something that can then consume it. Um, Node Red is something that can consume it, throw it up on a dashboard. There's other things out there. There's even SCADA systems that now support consuming MQTT data. The other one that, that is popular is REST. So anybody that goes up on Google and they type in, they want to search for something, and they want to search for a gazebo and they hit submit, that's REST protocol. Um, so if you visit the banner area back there, they got this DXM solution. The default way that DXM pushes is using REST. And REST comes in two flavors, get and put. The get is in the URL. So when I type in search for trucks and I hit submit, that's a rest. That goes up in the URL. If I enter my credit card information and submit, that's a put. That goes in the background. It's all encrypted. You never want to get your, you never want to use the get protocol for credit card information because now it's in your URL and anybody that's on a Wi-Fi hotspot can see your username, password, and credit card information. So that's two ways to get it up. So within PowerMation, we've got different solutions. And this is a graphic I stole from my Emerson presentation that if anybody's around in one hour, I'll be over there. Um, but an edge device. So uh, edge device would be an intelligent device that can push data. As an example, um, Emerson's got a little bus coupler that has MQTT push capabilities. Pretty sure we can do pushing at the edge maybe with Phoenix, but Phoenix has got the PLC Next controller, and that's a controller which would be more up into the edge computing side or maybe even the edge controller side. So the edge device would be specifically a sensor that can MQTT arrest push. The edge gateway 
Typically, those are protocol converters. Uh, one that we've got very popular is, is Red Lion. It's got this thing called the Flex Edge. We've got 300 protocols. We can get an Allen Bradley to talk to a Emerson PLC. It does protocol conversions, mixes those two. Uh, we can do protocol conversions with a Horner controller. You can have it connect Modbus to this thing, and you can do Ethernet IP to that thing, and then that's the protocol converter. So that's what these gateways do, converting protocols. Edge computing would be a computer sitting there doing all that work. So from Phoenix, for example, we get these little computers that run Linux or run Windows or something like that, and you can load it up with Node-RED and all these other software packages, and then you can do the converting um, inside of there. And then if you've got a device that actually can do ladder logic and actually do control, then that's called an edge controller. So at the Emerson booth, there's a CPE 400. It's, I call it bookshelf. It looks like a book. You'd mount it on the shelf, but it's clicks on a DIN rail. That's an edge computing because half of it runs Linux and the other half runs a ladder logic engine. And PLC Next, Ted will be talking about that next or this afternoon, this afternoon in a seminar. Um, the PLC Next has the same thing. It has edge control and it has um, the other side, which would be Linux, you know, to, to push data up to a cloud. Now, the Horner controller is a controller, so it's a controller, but it doesn't necessarily have edge computing capabilities because it's not a bi-directional connection to a cloud. So I would say that the Horner controller is a controller that has edge gateway capabilities. Um, the Red Lion is sort of the same way. It doesn't actually get data from a cloud and do math on it and then, you know, understand rules. We can have the PLC Next or the CPE 400 pull data down from a cloud and then do work on it and then send it. So the Red Lion would be a gateway with controller capabilities and so would the Horner. I'm just, for clarification, when you hear edge, it means one of these four things. Um, and then sometimes vendors get really overly excited. Um, I don't want to pick on Rital. They are here today. They're a great bunch, bunch of people. But Rital was telling me that they're IIoT. And I'm like, how are you IIoT? Oh, because we put computers inside of our controllers, so it makes us I. And I said, OK, well, then that this building is IIoT, too, because we have IIoT things inside this building. Well, not really. Um, it's more the functionality of the device, not the fact that it's housed inside of there. So. Another challenge that's been popping up, and this has been pretty prevalent um, in some of our HMIs are configured, and a lot of them in this area, of people have them out on their farms, you got a lot of lift stations, a lot of pumping stations, and all of a sudden you need information from it, right? So how do you get that information? Well, one way is to have the pump just send emails. Every day it sends an email, I'm okay or I've got a problem, Sell, you know, sends you run information and stuff like that. So what we said was, okay, sounds great. All we have to do is have that HMI, like our Horner controller or the Red Line device or the Emerson Quick Panel, send an email, and you just got to find out who the internet service provider is and use their their email. It's like port 25 email sending up. Sounds great. Sounds easy. Not so great. Not so easy. It's kind of complicated and hard to do because you need an email server sitting on premise or in your internet service provider. If you don't have that, oh, you know, next best thing, let's just send it right to Google. Well, guess what? Internet providers block port 25 because back in the 90s, a bad actor or, or an innocent person <laughs> would get infected with a virus from a bad actor that would use their computer to send out emails. And their emails were sent out on the, on, in the clear, pushing right through the internet service provider, but then the internet service provider was being blamed for being a spammer. Well, they didn't want to get blacklisted and have all their emails being blocked, so then they said, no, 100% of all traffic must go through, uh, mail traffic must go through our servers so we can vet it. And the way that they do that is they force you to log in to secure connections. And that's what Google does. They say, yep, use port 587, make it secure. So you have to log in with a valid email, valid password to be able to use our services. So then guess what the bad guys did? They started minting email addresses from the Google servers, right? Because it could be Terry Bush 123 and tomorrow 1234, you know. I could have six digits at the end of my name and I could have a million email addresses associated to me and every one of them could spam. And so they said, okay, well, 
we can't just let anybody do that. So then they're going to block that. But then they said, well, maybe what we'll do is we'll make one-time use passwords for these things so that every device has a unique password to log in. They tried that for a while, but then they were still minting those one-time use passwords. And logging into Google, how many of you do two-factor authentication? You log into your bank and it sends a text message to your phone or a password to, you know, to unlock. That's your second factor is your phone. So they did the same thing with Gmail and Outlook and others, where you log in and it says, hey, there's a, there's a second factor. You, you're going to get, so now every time your Horner controller sends an email, your phone is going to light up and say, you need to enter in this one-time use password to get the Horner controller to send the email through. That's not going to work. That's when they came out with those one-time use passwords for applications. But then they come back and go, eh, that's not going to work either because we need to have officially sponsored applications to send the email. And they said, yeah, Horner, we don't recognize Horner as an official application that can send an email to the Google servers. So there's another roadblock. So these roadblocks have been happening for the last five to eight years just in something as simple as sending an email. And so one of the things we can do with Sikamia, which is kind of cool, is it can be a, a relay for this outbound traffic. So whether it be MQTT, whether it be email, or whether it be REST, you can actually tell the site manager, which is the device you install inside your control panel, you can say, allow this to accept port 25 traffic, just like your ISPs back in the old days. It's then going to forward it up into the gate manager, and the gate manager has an email server on it, and then that sends it out for you to get access to it. The neat thing about that solution that a lot of people like is now you've got a, a device and you've got this horn of controller sitting there, and every one of these can be minted identical. It doesn't matter if there's a Verizon modem here that gets it out on the Internet, or if you plug it into a wall at the hotel here, or you plug it into a wall wherever, it's always going to send the email to the same thing, which is the device port of this guy, forward it up to the cloud, and then give you access to your, or sending that email out. And then guess what? Inside that email, you say, hey, there's a problem with this lift pump, or there's a problem with the sprinkler system. Go ahead and log in to the, the uh, Link Manager mobile app on your phone to be able to see what's wrong, acknowledge the alarm like I just launched it on my phone. So that's kind of a cool feature of what we can do to make it very easy to get that data from that deep down inside your defense in depth and get it out to the, to the service that needs to be done. So with all this, what have we learned? Nothing, no. Um, don't think security sec through security protects you. Go to shodan.io enter in a port number and, and see all of the juicy hits that you, again, don't click on anything or try to attempt to connect because that's a federal offense. Um, but also don't be surprised if your solutions are short-lived. Because if you find a workaround, um, I know this emailing thing, I know Horner's worked really hard trying to find a workaround, so they found one. But guess what? That workaround, which is sponsored by Google, might not last long because the bad guys find that workaround and they exploit it. And then all of a sudden now you got another problem. So be, be mindful of that. Always use secure comms, multi-factor authentication all the time. So I don't know if this is uh, not really dirty laundry. It's just an inter interesting event. So my wife and I are actually staying at the KOA in our RV, and we're going to head out tonight. And she was doing some work on her phone or something like that. And then we went and took the motorcycle and went drive around and went down to the, the river and stuff like that. And all of a sudden, her phone had a whole bunch of second-factor authentications on it. So something was attempting to log into her um, Outlook account, you know, first name dot last name at Outlook.com. And so then it was trying to figure out what's going on. We came to the conclusion that an app on her phone was probably trying to send an email or use her email address to be able to do something, you know, like if you sign up for dumb games or whatever, you enter in your email address. Um, I don't think it was a bad actor at the at the campground, even though they got an open Wi-Fi hotspot. But two factors of authentication prevented whatever this was from actually accessing your email account. So you have to make sure that you do that and also put on notifications so you're notified so you can make changes right away. So we did change your password and stuff like that just to be on the safe side. So that's that authentic, uh, uh, multi-factor authentication. If it is a nuisance, but I would recommend it. And then use the trusted remote access vendor don't try to bake your own because that can get you into trouble. 
Um, and then when using a service in a way that's not intended, beware of cha changes. So if you try to make these workarounds and if you say, hey, you know what, I really found this cool way to get around this thing, or I'm subscribing to the service and they don't have a revenue model, so then they're probably going to be out of business in a week, um, you got to be very careful of those types of things. Push data is easy, pulling data is hard. Um, use push protocols. It says they're new to the industry because that MQTT was developed back in the early 90s, but it's still in its infancy today. And, we're, and they're working through some of those bugs and, and hurdles. And then use routers and stop punching holes in them. That's the other thing that's, um, it's very easy to do in your home router. You go in there and say, well, it's just port forward. Nobody will figure out it's a Horner controller sitting here. Yeah, there's bad actors sitting in Russia and, and other parts of the world that are doing that. So. And don't be afraid, afraid to ask questions. So, That's kind of the fear, uncertainty, and doubt, and everybody's going to leave this room all depressed and all that, but no. Everybody's happy, right? Everybody's yeah, and then Rocco just turned his phone off, and he's stomping on it. So that, that prevents it from working. So, that, you know, there's things to be aware of, and, and if you're trying to play an elaborate game of whack-a-mole from the bad guys, it's a moving target, so... You have to be sort of mindful of that and then try to build out systems that are really sanctioned. You do have to pay a little money to do that oftentimes. You have to subscribe to services and stuff. Um, but, it, but at the end of the day, I'd rather spend a dollar a month or something like that to subscribe to like LastPass or something like that than have to figure out how to remember, you know, 100,000 unique passwords that are all 14 characters, a whole bunch of ASCII and numeric stuff in there. So, all right. Dude, where's my access? Thanks. Any questions, comments, concerns? Anything from Andrew in the back of the room? No? So the challenge with... Yeah, that's a good question. So the challenge with text messaging, which was what I've learned just be, you know, in coincidentally because of uh, Sikamiya, text message is, an, is a cellular exclusive function. And so if you do want to have a text message sent, um, you actually have to have it go through a cellular provider or you have to subscribe to something that will convert an email to text. Now Verizon uses vtext.com, AT&T is AT&T something something.com, can't remember. Um, yeah, the problem with those though is that they also are very mindful of people spamming people that way by, by shooting text messages to your cell phone via the email. So AT&T is very, very restrictive, and what will happen is they'll block a lot of those. So we've had customers that want to use the email functionality in a Horner controller or something to send a text message, and that's become very problematic, and, and a lot of the AT&T stuff stops working. Verizon lets it all go through, so you're, you're fine there. My recommendation is everybody's got a smartphone that has email pop-ups on it anyways. Just use... Um, email to be able to get that or write a mobile app to do it as well. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And the nice thing about and nice thing about those text to email or email to text services that, that you pay for is that they've got a business model with revenue so that they'll probably be in business for a while as opposed to some fly by night that thinks they're going to do advertising and make money on it and then they act, they go away and your whole infrastructure collapses so yeah all right you got eight more minutes of your day left right make good use of it i think the next one is at 10:30 if i'm not mistaken so 10.30. Thanks, guys.